We are looking at Harry Frankfurt's approach to free will and moral responsibility. And this could be called a hierarchical view. Sometimes it's been called the deep self view. In part one, we'll try to lay out the basics of the theory. And I'm following his article titled Freedom of the Will and the Concept of the Person. And we're going to stick with that article text fairly closely to make sure that we get this right because it is fairly complex. So he starts with this task of asking the big question, what is a person? Now, obviously in an article, he's not going to be able to adequately address this question. It's an extremely challenging question. Certainly though, we can lay out some ideas here. We're not talking about just humans, right? We're not just talking about whatever has homo sapien DNA. So Frankfurt, for example, clearly rules out uh, the, an embryo in development. He, have, he also rules out a, a baby or a very young child from being a person as we get into the details. Uh, of course, an embryo, uh, a fetus, a baby, a young child all have homo sapiens DNA. And so that's not a biological concept that we're worried about here. The philosophically interesting attributes of being a person are not necessarily specific to a species. So just take any science fiction where they're involved aliens or maybe androids who seem to be persons, right? It seems pretty reasonable that you could be a person but not be a human. An essential difference here between what makes something a person and what is not, according to Frankfurt, is the structure of a person's will. So that's what we're going to especially spend time on here. So besides having desires like other animals do, we certainly can attribute desires to many mammals, for example, a person may want to have or lack certain desires. That is, a person is the kind of being who is capable of wanting to be different wanting to have desires other than the ones they actually have. So that is a characteristic of a person. Now we've already used the word want. So what does it mean to want something? Well, Frankfurt first says it's, this is somewhat of an odd concept. It's, it's a challenging concept, especially because he points out that this statement, A wants to X, is actually consistent with a lot of other statements that don't initially seem to be reasonable. So A may want to do X, even though the prospect of doing X has no emotional attachment whatsoever. It could be that A is unaware of the want. So uh, persons are complex enough to have wants that we don't even know that we have. A may even believe that he doesn't want to X, even though he actually does have that desire to X, we can be deceived about our desires. A may even want to refrain from Xing, from, from the action of doing X, right? So we'll look at a case in just a few minutes of an example of that. Another example, it's consistent with A would rather Y than X and cannot do both. So A may want to, uh, have a certain piece of pie for dessert, but there's another piece of pie of a different flavor and you can only have one. And they may want both recognizing the, the two choices and yet they may have a preference between the two even though they desire both. And then finally, an odd situation, A would rather die than X. And Frankfurt doesn't give an example of this, but I, I, in watching in, from TV shows and movies, I, I've seen cases somewhere where you have somebody like a pedophiliac and he doesn't want to uh, commit an assault against a child, but he has the desire to do so. And in fact, uh, he stro so hates himself and having that desire, he would rather die than abuse a child and so that might be an example where the want is still there, but A would rather die than X. Usually I would think of 
uh, pathological situations where this would be the case. Okay, so what else could we say about A wants to X? Well, it could also mean that there's a motivation that moves A to X. Now, we haven't been thinking along those lines in our previous examples, uh, so it could be that A wills X. So sometimes when we say A wants to do X, A wants to X, we mean there's a motivation and that motivation is effective. The desire is effective. Now, notice it's not uh, coextensive with intending to do X, right? So those are two different ways of thinking about wanting. And Frankfurt then introduces this idea of first order and second order desires. Now, first order desires are the ones we were talking about initially, those wants we have, right? Those desires we have that motivate action. These are common to many animals. So a dog wants food, it goes to the bowl of food and that motivates the action. Now, by the way, Frankfurt clarifies he's for purposes here, using want and desires as synonyms, even though he recognized there uh, could be important distinctions made between the two. A second order desire though, is obviously a higher level where one wants to have certain first order desires. So uh, maybe you don't want to study, but you do have this desire to succeed. And so you desire to have the want to study so that you will then study and be successful in a course. So roughly speaking, and there are going to be a lot of complexities as we talk through this, especially when we get to part two, but roughly now we have an idea of free will for Frankfurt. If there's a conformity between one's first order desires and one's second order or higher order desires, then that person has free will and that person is morally responsible for what they do. And so that's, sufficient for more responsibility. Now, again, we have to clarify a couple of aspects of, of first and second order desires here, but that then obviously is going to be consistent with determinism, right? There's nothing that rules out determinism being the case and some, someone succeeding in having their first order desires in conformity with second order desires. Now let's look at A wants to X uh, again, a little bit more closely. So it could be that X is a first order desire. Now we'll look at that example that I promised when A would uh, wants to refrain from Xing even though A wants to X. So this could be that A wants X, that's the first order desire, but we have an example of a physician, maybe a psychiatrist who treats substance abuse patients and he's having difficulty relating to the patients. So he wants to relate to addicts by having the desire, right, to want the drug. So he wants to know what it feels like to have the des desire to want the drug. That's what he wants. He wants to be in that state so that he recognizes the, the pull that the drug may have for the addict. Now, this is consistent with wanting to not take the drug, right? He doesn't actually want to suppose it's heroin, uh, an extremely addictive substance. He doesn't actually want to take heroin. He's, he's concerned that that would be very problematic. That might cause trouble for him. It, it's easy to become addicted to heroin. So he doesn't actually want to take it, but he does want to have the want to take the drug. Right? So he doesn't want that to be the effective want, the one that actually motivates him to action. So that's an example of a case uh, where somebody wants the drug X, but they don't want to actually take the drug. Okay, here's a, a second order case uh, again. And so let's suppose um, it may be that X is a first order desire. However, in this case, uh, the person may want to make that the effective one. So unlike the previous case with the psychiatrist, uh, 
In this case, uh, this is more like along the lines of the person wanting to study. So that's his example. Uh, they have a second order desire to concentrate on one's work. So you're at a job, you have an important task you need to accomplish, but you keep getting distracted and you have this desire to focus on your work. You also do have this first order desire to focus on your work. Uh, that is something you, you want to be able to do when you're at work, right? So unlike the first case with the, the psychiatrist here, this is the case of second order volition. He, may, he distinguishes second order willing from second order volition. Uh, and the difference is whether you actually want the first order to desire to succeed. And that's what the person wants in this case. The person wants the desire to be effective, that desire to concentrate on one's work. That's the desire they want to be effective. And so this is the case of, in, if successful, this would be an example of having free will. So whatever it is that we're talking about where they have a first order desire and they want that first order desire to be effective uh, and then they're able to do so, they have free will. Now we're gonna qualify that slightly, but that would be a case of somebody having more responsibility then. That's the kind of free will necessary for moral responsibility. Okay, let's think about second order volitions a little bit more, make sure that we're clear on these. What Frankfurt says is he goes back to our starting point, what is a person? And he says, second order volitions are essential for being a person. So now you can see why uh, most other animals and a young baby or a very young child would not be a person because they would not have those second order volitions. They wouldn't be able to reflect on what kind of desires that they want to have. So it's possible though that someone has second order desires without having second order volitions. They don't have the will to want to have the want to be effective, okay? So they can have a desire to have certain first order desires or wants, but not really care which one is effective. So when there are no second order volitions, what Frankfurt uses is this term wanton. He says, this is, not, this is not a person, but a wanton. And he says that young children and animals might be wanton. They just have these desires and they really don't care that they have the desires and that's what they act on. So wantons could have a rational faculty, so, right? Somebody could be extremely rational and be a wanton according to Frankfurt, right? They may deliberate. They may deliberate about how to get their wants fulfilled, for example. They may scheme, for example, on how to get their wants met, right? but they don't care about the desirability of the desires themselves. They don't do that kind of reflection and have a motive that certain wills or wants are certain wants, sorry, not wills, certain wants. They don't have the motive that certain wants are effective over others. And the structure of a person then for Frankfurt, uh, the person's will, sorry, a little typo there, it presupposes that the person is capable of rational behavior, right? In order to have these second order reflections on one want, what one wants, you have to have that capacity for rational behavior. So that is essential for being a person, but obviously for Frankfurt, it's not sufficient for being a person because a, rash, a wanton could have these rational faculties and not be a person. So uh, again, person versus wanton, Let's think about two different kinds of addicts. First would be an unwilling addict. So his desire for the drug does not comport with his second order desire not to take the drug. So there's a, so he wants to not be an addict. He wants to not desire the drug, but he has the uh, first order desire to take the drug. And let's suppose that succeeds, he's addicted and continues to take the drug. Now, A though identifies himself with this second order volition. That's who A considers himself to be, the person who doesn't want to take the drug. So he doesn't identify with the first order desire. And here, uh, Frankfurt talks about, you can kind of imagine this 
being separate from the, the first order desires are kind of an external force almost motivating the person to action. That's not who they really are. They don't want to be like that. And so that would be someone with a second order desire. And that would be a person. What they want is for the refraining from the taking the drug to be effective. Now, uh, uh, compare that or contrast that with a want, right? The want it doesn't care about the first order desire for the drug. They they're fine with it. They well, actually, they don't. They just they're ambivalent toward it. Is the way Frankfurt puts it. It's not that they approve of it. They just don't care. They're ambivalent, and wantons just don't have any preferences with regard to the first order desires. So again. They can be rational, right? They can figure out how to get the drug that they want, right? And that might require rationality to do so, uh, of course, but they just don't care what their first order desires are. Okay, so finally, free will. It's only because the person has second order volitions that he's capable of enjoying or lacking the freedom of the will. So wantons, won't have freedom of the will, right? A traditional view of free will is the idea that one can act freely. So a lot of the literature uh, talks about acting freely. Is this an action that one person took freely? W.T. Stace talks a bit about this. John Martin Fisher talks about this. Uh, other people talk about this. This is a, a focus of the literature, being able to act freely. Now, all of what Frankfurt's been doing is concentrating on the will. And this is a weakness in the literature that we often don't distinguish carefully between acting freely and willing freely. And so Frankfurt has set up the opportunity to make that distinction clearly with his theory. So a person with free will is able to will what he wants to will or uh, you may say, have the will that he wants to have. And we're introducing a, a, a little bit of complexities that we're going to have to address in part two. But that's what's going on with free will, right? Th think of the person who wants to concentrate on their work. They have the desire to concentrate on their work, but they're being distracted. And the second order volition is to desire that that desire is effective. And then they succeed. That's acting with free will. That's an example of having free will. Now, the unwilling addict's will, though, is not free, right? It, as long as there's an unresolved conflict among the second order desires, uh, maybe there's not, maybe there is in this case, uh, but those are conflicting with one another, then that person's will is not free. Um, they may be able, though, to be able to do what they want to, to get the drug and take the drug. And Frankfurt says, well, that seems to be a reasonable uh, case of somebody acting freely, but they don't have free will. And so you can act freely without having free will, according to Frankfurt. You can also have free will and not act freely, according to Frankfurt. So uh, again, I've mentioned that we have a few areas here that are introducing complexities. So we need to address those complexities in part two. And then we'll also raise some criticisms or concerns about his theory in part two.